live event. If everybody can see me and can hear me all right, give me a thumbs up on your end just so I know the tech is working. Now, one of the things I want to say before we even get started, you're at the right place to watch this event. I was noticing in the comment section that there are some folks who are trying to redirect you to watch this somewhere else. Please do not click that. It seems that popular events like this sometimes attract spammers. And unfortunately, there are some here. So I just want to warn all of you, you're at the right place. So please do not click out of this event because that's going to redirect you to a completely different site, which I have no idea where that is going to take you. So please do not click it. Stay here. We are at the right place to talk about communication tips to stand out. So again, if everybody can hear me, give me a thumbs up on your end. It is so fantastic seeing everybody. And I was just looking at the comments of where people are dialing in from, and it is so fantastic. I know we have folks around the world right now, which to me, oh my gosh, it makes me so excited to see how such an event like this can draw in such an international audience. Now, to get started, I want to first welcome everybody. This is our first LinkedIn Live, which we call our Soulcast Media Live in 2023. And it's a topic that is so incredibly important. It's communication tips to stand out. Now, just so you all know, this event actually was supposed to be with one of my guests, but she wasn't able to attend. And she let us know about two weeks ago. And I was thinking, you know, should I still do this event? And I was like, you know what? This is an event that I think we have to do. We have to talk about communication tips, especially because it's the new year. And thinking about how we can better show up at work is something, I mean, we should always be thinking about that, but there's no better time to focus on these skills than right now. A quick housekeeping tip. So today's event is going to be about 45 minutes or so, and it's going to go by fast. I have so many tips I'm going to be sharing with you in regards to how you can level up your communication skills. And one of the coolest things is, I'm just looking right now, we have over 170 of you dialed in again from around the world. Now I want you to know, this event is for you. If you have any questions, please throw it into the chat function. Sometimes in terms of tech stuff, it may jump back to a home screen in the middle of my presentation. I don't know, it's the tech gods here that I have no control over. But if you find yourself getting redirected back, just refresh this and it should bring you back automatically to the event. So that's just some quick housekeeping tips. So without further ado, let's get started. Now, one of the things I want to mention to you all is I'm going to be sharing a lot of tips. So feel free to take down notes or, um, you know, just jot down notes. I know sometimes a lot of folks are you know doing some work while while listening to this, but I'm going to be sharing so many tips. So I would really encourage you to pay attention because there's going to be a few things I'm going to be sharing with you today. You'll see here on the screen. Today, I'm going to be talking about communication tips to stand out. And I'm going to be sharing with you all three strategies. These are my favorite strategies when it comes to being a better communicator in the workplace. But in addition to these strategies, I'm going to share with you how you can implement these in the workplace. My hope is at the end of today's talk, you can see here on the screen, I hope you will all be able to walk away feeling a lot more confident in your communication skills. Now, communications is one of those things that we can all improve on. Perhaps you may be thinking, you know, I'm already pretty comfortable communicating with my team, but I say communications is a skill that constantly needs to be learned because situations change. The people who you're interacting with changes. So that means the skills needed need to increase. So today I'm gonna to be sharing with you the three things that I want you to know. But before we dive into what those three things are, which I'm going to share with you in just a little bit, I wanna do a quick intro um, of who I am for those who are not familiar. So my name is Jessica Chen, and I'm the founder and CEO of Soulcast Media, and we are a global communications training company. I started Soulcast Media about four years ago, and I'm so honored to call some of the top companies clients. 
We work with Fortune 100 companies. I've spoken at companies like Google, Microsoft, DraftKings, Mattel. Oh my gosh, I can go on and on to teach their team how to be better communicators. But prior to Soulcast Media, I used to be a TV news reporter. So that meant I was on TV every single day telling the news. You can see some of the pictures here that I have on this screen. The picture all the way on the right is me when I was working at the ABC station in San Diego, California. So TV, communicating, public speaking, that was my world before I started Soulcast Media. Now, a lot of people say, well, why did you leave? Why did you leave the TV world? Well, one of the reasons why I decided to leave was because the truth was I was not a good communicator when I first started out in that industry. But because of almost almost 10 years as a journalist, I learned so many good things about how everyone can be a better speaker that I was like, you know what? I need to teach folks this. A lot of the things we were taught how to present how to develop executive presence, I was thinking, you know what? These are things that people should be able to learn. One of the, one of the things that I also resonated in, and I really wanted to share this with folks is I'm a huge introvert. I'm fairly shy, naturally. People used to say, oh, Jessica, she's kind of the quiet one. But that's the thing. When I teach folks how to be better communicators, I'm really coming from a place where I understand how it can be hard sometimes. It can be hard when you're surrounded by folks on your team at work who are just so loud and they may be even confident, right? They just have that confidence that, you know, I personally never experienced before. I had to figure out, wait, how did they show up with so much confidence and how can I do that too? So when I approach communicating, and that's really the philosophy of our work here at Soulcast Media, it's really coming from a place to teach people how to be better communicators. And that is what we do today because let me say, I get it. I get it, it's hard, but here's the thing, it's possible. So with that in mind, I wanna share with you this friction because this friction in the workplace is going to help me introduce the three strategies with you today. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, when I was starting out as a reporter, I, I wasn't a good communicator. And one of the reasons why was because of this, this idea of feeling that friction in the workplace. I mentioned earlier that I would look around and I would see, for example, some of my colleagues, they would show up, they would have this bravado, they would be so, they would be so charismatic that I was like, I don't know how to do that, right? And I thought about this a lot. And part of the reason why I thought about this a lot was because we had to be good communicators every day. And I realized one of the reasons why I struggled with communications early on myself was because I was also living in what I call these worlds of dualities, meaning I was taught this one thing of how I should communicate, how I should show up. But what I saw actually translated to workplace success was completely different. And that caused a lot of this initial confusion for me on how can I be a better communicator? I'm gonna go with you, I'm gonna go through with you what some of these dualities are. And I would be curious to see if some of this actually resonates with you as you think about where you are in your own work today. So some of the things that I was personally taught was how do you carry yourself? How do you communicate? How do you contribute in the workplace? Well, hmm. I was always taught the way you carry yourself in the workplace was you speak up, right? You sit up at the table. When it comes to communicating, you want to contribute your thoughts and offer feedback. When it comes to contributing, well, you got to be involved, right? You have to raise your hand, right? But what I saw actually translated was something completely different. So when I heard people say, okay, you gotta speak up, you gotta sit at the table, you gotta contribute, you gotta offer feedback, you gotta be involved. What I saw was people would say, but you know, if you speak up too much, people will see you unfavorably. If you communicate too much, if you offer too much feedback, you're actually judged more harshly. If you contribute and you raise your hand, well, you better be careful because you might get assigned a lot of busy work. 
okay, this is what I meant. I was taught to do these one thing, yet I was like, but why is it not necessarily translate into this workplace success that I thought would happen? I thought about this a lot. And I realized a lot of it had to do with this. It's really about being a strategic communicator that can transform how you show up, what you say, and how you say it. And that essentially is at the core of why I started Soulcast Media, because I realized communications is a skill that can truly open up so many more opportunities. But the thing is, a lot of us aren't really taught how to be strategic communicators. You know, when we go to school, right, we're taught how to write essays. We're taught how to write long essays. But in the working world, it's not about being long-winded. You have to be able to communicate your points quickly and concisely. That's just one example that I sometimes feel when it comes to education, we're not taught the workplace communication skills that we need to actually better show up. So with that in mind, I want to share with you all the three things that we are going to tackle today. And like I mentioned earlier, please feel free to write down these notes. But I will say, if you are in the middle of doing work while watching this and you cannot you know, take down all the notes that I'm going to be sharing with you, here on the screen is a QR code. This QR code gets you access to our VIP communications pass. I know a lot of you already are our VIP members, but if you have a VIP communications pass, we send you all the show notes from events like this because we get it. Sometimes it's hard to take down all the notes and I know there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to be talking about. So if you're ever thinking, wait, wh what did Jessica just say? I highly encourage you to grab one of our VIP communications passes here because that'll essentially give you access to all the things we're going to be talking about and we compile that information for you. So with that, let's get started. Number one, the first thing I want to share with you all today is this idea of reframing your limiting beliefs. I'm going to go over what that means. The second thing I want to share with you is how can you speak to convince? How can you convince your stakeholders, your manager, your client, including your team? This has to do with communications. And then finally, public speaking. I'm going to be sharing some of my favorite tips when it comes to public speaking because public speaking is probably one of the most important skills that we need to learn. And let me tell you this, public speaking isn't just giving a presentation. When you speak up in a meeting, that is a form of public speaking. Now, one of the things I want to share with you is going to be at the end. And this is going to be what I truly believe is the number one most important communication skill that I want you to learn in 2023. I'm going to share that at the very end. So be sure to listen to the very end because I'm going to share with you the three things here and then end with my number one most important communication strategy. So with that, let's get started. Reframing limiting beliefs. So what does this mean? In the communications world, I talk a lot about teaching folks how to reframe limiting beliefs. And I think this is one of the most important fundamental things to start out with. And the reason why I'm starting out with this is because if you want to be a stronger communicator, you need to first get out of any limiting beliefs that you might have. So what are limiting beliefs? Limiting beliefs are judgments we make about our abilities that prevent us from feeling confident and reaching our full potential. Some of these things may be things like imposter syndrome, some of the things we tell ourselves like, oh, we can't do it, right? When it comes to communications, it's incredibly important that you are in the right mental space, because sometimes people will say, well, Jessica, I don't think I can ever be that confident communicator. And I say, no, 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 no. That is a limiting belief. And I always say, I'm a living, I'm living proof of somebody who can really just kind of break out of that shell in order to learn how to 
do these things I'm going to be teaching you today. So when do limiting beliefs typically creep up in our mind? Well, it can happen when someone criticizes us. It can happen when we are suddenly feeling like we are an outsider. It can also pop up with things like feeling like we're an imposter. I'm actually curious right now, for those who are watching, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever experienced what I'm calling these limiting beliefs? If so, I'm curious, type it into the chat. When, when has this popped up for you the most? Do you have these limiting beliefs when you're sitting in a meeting? Do you have these limiting beliefs when your boss says something to you? Do you have these limiting beliefs when you are giving a presentation? Throw it into the chat function. I see some folks are saying yes, that this is something that you completely resonate with. But I'm curious, when does that happen to you the most? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of folks saying, yes, I can relate <laughs> a thousand percent every day. So I'm looking to the left because that's where I see some of the comments coming in. Imposter syndrome. Absolutely. And I love to see folks yeah, in a room of leaders when presenting. That's actually where I see a lot of folks, they say when there's when they're in a room with a lot of leaders and they're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Am, am I saying something that's going to make me look silly? Oh my gosh, yes. And, and it's great to see these comments of you all saying yes, because it's almost reassuring to know that you are not alone. You are not alone in feeling these limiting beliefs. Yes, I see a lot of folks are saying yes. So here's the question. A lot of us feel these limiting beliefs when we're in the workplace. And when it comes to communications, we can really doubt our abilities. So the question is, what do we do about it? Well, let's first talk about what this sounds like. Limiting beliefs, and let me know if some of these resonates with you. You're telling yourself, I don't think I can do it. I don't want to look silly. I don't want to fail. I don't want to be taken advantage of. I don't want to lose. These are just some examples of these limiting beliefs that you may tell yourself when you're in front of your team, when you're in front of your manager, when you're in front of leaders. So the question is now, if you do see and hear yourself saying these things, and trust me, I used to say these things to myself too, especially when I felt intimidated in the workplace. Well, one of the things that I realized is how can you reframe? How can you reframe these limiting beliefs, right? That's the thing we're talking about today. Well, in the communications world, I talk about this concept called labeling. And this is where, if you all are taking notes right now, this is where I want you to focus on labeling. Because labeling is how you can reframe any of these limiting beliefs that you may have that may pop up from time to time. So what is labeling? Labeling essentially is being able to identify when these negative thoughts pop into your mind. Noticing it is incredibly important, but the second step to that is being able to actually give that negative thought a name. It sounds kind of funny, but this is what it means. It's incredibly helpful for you to say, oh, that negative voice that I'm hearing, what's a name I can call it? And I'm going to share it, uh, an example with you. So I was once working with a client and she was recently promoted to a more managerial position. So she was put in a place where now her peers were people who reported up to her. So suddenly she was feeling a lot of this imposter syndrome that instead of her being with her peers, she was now managing. So because she was in this position, she felt a lot of that imposter syndrome and thinking, what do I do? You know, what can I say? How can I be a good leader? And I said, you know, if you ever find yourself saying any of these things, I don't think I can do it. I don't want to look silly. What can you label that negative thought? And we thought about it and she was like, you know what? I don't really like the vegetable celery. I'm going to call all my negative thoughts the word celery. And it was such a funny moment because I was like, that's fantastic. If you ever catch yourself saying and thinking all these negative thoughts, 
you can say, that's the celery talking. That's if you don't like celery. If you love celery, maybe call it something else. But you can say, you know what? This is a celery talking. I'm going to stop. And I'm going to pivot my thought. So then I asked her, what's a vegetable you do like? And then she said, I really like mushrooms. And then I said, okay, when you notice these negative thoughts, tell the celery to stop talking and then bring up the mushrooms. And I know this sounds so silly, but sometimes these silly things work. But the real point is the idea with labeling is it gets you to acknowledge that these are negative thoughts and that you can almost call upon the good thoughts, the thoughts that will empower you. That client of mine, she actually took out a sticky note and she actually wrote down right these words and she actually taped it on her computer just so she would remember that she could identify and label these things. Because when you can identify it, then you can reframe your thought. So suddenly the good thoughts are, wait a second, how do I know I really cannot do it? How do I know I really will look silly? Maybe I won't. How do I know that I, I'm actually going to fail? How do I know that I'm going to be taken advantage of, ha, advantage of? How do I know I will lose? So do you see here, instead of it being a statement, you're making it into a question because statements sometimes can cripple us, right? We're telling ourselves these things that may or may not be true. But by labeling and thinking, wait a second, I didn't. I need to reframe this. Suddenly, it makes you think, maybe I actually can do it. Maybe I actually won't look silly. Maybe I won't fail. I just need to try. So this is what I mean about reframing limiting beliefs. Now, let's go into our second point. Speaking to convince. Now, whether we realize it or not, most of the time when we are communicating to our manager, to our team, we're actually convincing them. We are convincing them of an idea that we have. Aristotle is a Greek philosopher. I'm sure all of us have heard of him before, but he always said that when we speak, we're actually speaking to persuade. And I 100% agree with that statement. We speak because we're trying to get our ideas approved. We speak Let's say we're talking to our manager because we may want to ask for a raise. We want to ask for a promotion. We want to get on a new project that can help with our visibility. We are maybe even pitching a new initiative. All these things are us speaking to convince. And chances are it happens almost every day, if not at least every week. But the thing is, anytime you say we're speaking to convince, people go, oh my gosh, okay, I get it, but I don't really know how to do it strategically. And I get it, it's really uncomfortable for people to think about it like this because sometimes people are like, well, I don't want to be too pushy, right? When we think of speaking and persuading, you're like, I don't want to seem, yeah, seem too pushy. I don't, I don't, I want to feel out how everyone is, is, is thinking before I suggest something. I'm actually curious, in the chat right now, is this something that you have felt before? This idea, like, have you ever thought about, wait, yeah, speaking a lot of the times is about persuading my team. If this is how you feel, let me know in the chat function, because if you think about it this way, you can now be more strategic in how you approach these meetings and how you approach these conversations. So in the work that we do at Soulcast Media, one of my favorite techniques that I teach people is how. How do you be persuasive? So to think about this, I want you to look at your screen right now if you see it. To be persuasive, you have to think of your communications in two ways. Quantitative driven points are when we speak, we're talking about facts, data, you know, numbers, right? You know, a lot of us who are in technical roles, this becomes very second nature when we communicate. Oh, when we look at the metrics here, when we look at the data here, we, we communicate that way when we're talking to our team. But there's also another side of communicating that I think a lot of people don't really think about as much. And this is what we call the emotionally driven points. Now, if you want to be a persuasive speaker, 
it's not doing one or the other. It's actually doing both together. So I'm going to share with you a little bit more of what these two mean. But perhaps you may now gravitate more towards a quantitative driven points that you're making. But I want to share with you how you can also add in some emotion in your speaking because together that is how you can be a strategic and powerful speaker. So quantitative driven points. Here are some examples of what this would sound like. So this could be you saying something like, do you see the data here? Our customers gave us five stars, right? For example, this is what I would consider a quantitative driven point because you're talking about something that's factual, that's there, it's, you know, metrics driven. This is great, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Here's another example. We lost X, Y, and Z amount of products, right? It's, again, very factual, very to the point. There's evidence for it. But what do I mean? by incorporating some emotionally driven points in your communications. Well, look here on the right-hand column. For the first example that I gave, you can say the same thing, but say it like this. There's no denying our customers love our product based on these fantastic reviews that you see. Do you see the difference here? We're still making that same point. But the one on the left-hand side, it's more, hey, this is what it is. This is matter of fact. But the emotionally driven points is now you're talking about these emotions. Now, people are like, wait, is there even a place for that in the workplace? Absolutely. If you're trying to convince people, sometimes you need to loop in more of that kind of language because that's the kind of language that people are like, oh, right? A lot of times, as objective as we want to be at work, sometimes we can lead with also with our feelings of things. So when you think about it that way, your communications to persuade has to link in the emotional part of it. But here's the thing. It's about doing them together. It's not necessarily focusing on just speaking in this matter-of-fact, quantitative way. It's doing that while looping in the emotionally driven points. So on the second, Here's an example. So we said, we lost X, Y, and Z amount of product. Another way you can say it that's more emotionally driven is by saying, we were in shock when we saw how much inventory was lost. Do you see how the second one now, it's like you can feel that depth. And that's what I'm getting at. A lot of us can practice how to do both. And that's the thing, like I said, it's not one or the other. It's being able to do and loop in and marry both quantitative and emotionally driven points together in your communication because that is how you can be convincing. So think about that as you're perhaps wanting to pitch a new project, wanting to suggest a new idea. It's how can you frame your communications this way? Let me know in the chat if this is something that resonates with you. I'm seeing some of the comments that are coming in. And I love talking about, I love just talking about communications because I feel like these are the things that we're not necessarily taught. But if you think about this strategically, it makes a lot of sense. So let's go into our third point. Our third point is now public speaking. I would say most of the folks who reach out to us at Soulcast Media, including some of our learning and development partners, they tell us, can you come in and teach our team how to be better public speakers and presenters? And a lot of them say, we've all been in a lot of meetings where presentations is not our team's strong suit. I'm happy to say that public speaking is probably one of the, the, the most popular thing that we teach here at Soulcast Media. And it's great because a lot of the, the techniques that I, I teach folks comes from my TV background because we were presenting every single day. So today I wanna to share with you some of these tips. Now, when it comes to your public speaking, I know it can get a lot of people feeling nervous. If public speaking is something that you actually dread, actually throw it to the chat function. Let me know if public speaking is something that, hey, maybe you love. If you love it, please let me know as well. If you feel like you've mastered presentations, please share that. Or if you're like, oh gosh, anytime I have to make a presentation, I get so nervous and I cannot sleep for a week. 
<laughs> whatever it is, just let me know your thoughts about public speaking. And I will definitely share with you public speaking was something that I used to be, oh gosh, right? Because you're just front and center. But let me share with you, when it comes to thinking about how you can improve your public speaking, you have to think about ROI. Your, your, what can you do in your public speaking that will get people to really see you as a great speaker? All of us want to be seen as great, great speakers, right? So there's so much that we can say about public speaking, but because our time today is very, very limited, I want to share with you just the things that I feel you should focus on so you can essentially focus your time in these areas of your presentations. I love, yeah, I see some of the comments, 50-50 on presentations. I thrive on the energy from public speaking. I love these comments. Yes, I don't love it. I hear you. I don't love public speaking. Okay, but here I'm going to be teaching you all the things I want you to focus on that can give you the biggest ROI for your presentation. I want you to think about how you start your presentations. I want you to think about how you transition between your slides and your points. And I want you to think about how you end your presentation. Like I said, there's, I teach hours in, in terms of, I teach, I teach teams so much when it comes to public speaking and presentations, and it often takes hours, but because we only have not much time today, I just want to focus on these three points. When you think about practicing and putting together your presentation, you want to give extra emphasis on these three things. How do you start your presentation? How do you transition between your slides? And how you end your presentations? Because presentations, they can often be, what, like 15, 20 minutes long, maybe longer or shorter, depending on what it is. But when you think about your audience, what are they, when are they going to be most paying attention? Well, they're definitely going to be paying attention in the beginning. So you want to make sure that you are starting off strong. But in the middle of your presentation, you also want to be mindful of how you transition. I'm going to share what that means. And at the same time, how you end your presentation is really the lasting impression they're going to have of you. So what does this all mean? When it comes to how you start your presentation, again, feel free to write down notes or we're going to do it for you in the VIP communications pass here. I want you to think about a few things. I want you to think about starting your presentation by actually including a story. A story is probably one of the most impactful ways to begin a presentation because stories is what can bring a concept to life. Stories make concepts, ideas, relatable. Now, a lot of times when I say stories, people are like, how do I do that if my presentation is more technical? Am I supposed to say once upon a time? No, <laughs> that's not what I mean by stories. Stories are essentially you looping in real life scenarios, real life examples that can accentuate the point that you want to make. Do you have a customer experience that you can share? That is a story. If you start out your presentation with a story, it's one of the easiest ways to get people to understand why you're talking about this. The second thing I want you to think about is I want you to also start with the most interesting piece of information. The most interesting piece of information can be something like, what's the takeaway? What's the big result that you found? What's something that you want your team to do? Sometimes people think it's what you say at the end, right? Your takeaway. In the TV world, we were always taught this phrase, don't bury the lead. This is exactly the same thing in any workplace presentation. Whatever headline, whatever big thing you want your team, your clients, whatever it is you want them to know, you want to say it explicitly in the very beginning because that is how they will know, oh, wow, okay, I'm interested because you are giving them that piece of information from the very beginning. It's also incredibly important for you to tell people 
what they are going to get out of your presentation today. Don't assume people know. Even though everybody knows they're jumping into right a 2 p.m. meeting and they know you're going to do a presentation, but being explicit about what they're going to get out of it will make sure that you hook the audience. In fact, all three of these things that I'm just sharing right now, it's meant to hook your audience in. I mentioned earlier, the beginning is where you have your audience's attention. So if you cannot hook your audience in at the very beginning, it's going to be much harder to regain their attention during the middle of your presentation. So think about these three things. By the way, I just want to pause right now. And I am just amazed at how there are over 200 of you dialed in right now learning these communication tips. Hopefully you are all finding this incredibly helpful as you think about these skills that I've talked about so far. So yes, I'm seeing also the comments coming in. So appreciate that you are all here. For those who are just joining, hello, we're talking about communication tips to stand out. Okay, let's continue. The second part of your presentation is the middle, right? How do you want to think about the middle of your presentation? Well, there are a few things. It's incredibly important for you to maintain what I call here at Soulcast Media, fluidity. We have all been in presentations, we've heard people in presentations where they seem so choppy, choppy in their speaking. They either jump around in their presentation and it's like their flow of thinking makes you as a, a listener, it's hard to understand, right? They're choppy, uh, they're using filler words, right? But the mark of a great speaker is to have what we call that fluidity. So what can you do to have more of that fluidity? This is probably one of my favorite techniques that I'm going to share with you. And I think this is something that we could all practice. So when you think about your presentations right now, chances are you are putting together a deck, right? You are, you have your, all your slides. When you actually present, right, you're going from slide to slide. A lot of times when people are clicking that next button, they have this gap, this gap in their speaking, this silence, maybe like a second or two as they transition, right? You can see here on the screen, I'm trying to illustrate it for you. They're transitioning from slide to slide and there is this silence. That silence, unless strategic, it can break that fluidity. So what can you think about doing instead? I always tell my clients, and this is what I teach folks in our training, you want to fill that silence with transition words. Transition words are things like, this brings me to, which is why we can also see here at our next slide. Do you see what I'm doing here? Instead of transitioning in silence between my slides, I'm actually connecting what slide A has to do with slide B, what slide B has to do with slide C. But you have to actually say these words. Now, what words you say, of course, is going to depend on what your slides actually entail. But thinking about the transition words as you transition between slides can give the impression that you have fluidity in your speaking. And those who are listening to you will feel like, wow, Jessica's a really smooth speaker, right? So this is probably something that is, I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easy, but it's something that if you practice, it will become natural as you transition. Because like I said, unless your silence or your pause is strategic, it can make your presentation feel choppy. Finally, what do you do at the end? What do you do at the end of your presentation so you can leave a lasting impact? It's important for you to end your presentation thinking about how you can make it memorable. People have just sat through your 15, 20 minute presentation. So how do you want to end it so they go, wow, that was really good. You want to do this. If you started with a story, like I mentioned earlier, you want to also end 
with a story. Ending with a story makes it feel like what we call having a full circle moment. It kind of paints a complete picture. If you said something in the beginning, make sure you reiterate it again at the end. So people go, oh, I see why she said that at the beginning. Okay, the middle of the presentation was her explaining. And now you're reiterating that point at the end so they understand, oh, okay, that's how it all connects. But you have to say it. The second is having a clear call to action. What do you want the team to do? Do you want them to do this? Do you want them to visit that, right? Whatever it is you want them to do, be clear with a call to action. In fact, as a presenter, you should have a call to action. You spent so much time putting a presentation together. You should be able to ask your audience, your team to do whatever it is you want them or hopefully you want them to do next, whether it's maybe even preparing something for a next meeting, whatever it is, have a clear call to action. And then third, make sure you continuously have energy. Oftentimes at the end of a presentation, you've been speaking for a while now, your energy may start to wane. You may start kind of going in a monotone voice, but no, your energy has to be up the entire time. In fact, it's even more important to end on a high note because that is how you can create that memorable presentation. So here are the things that I want you to think about your end. End with a story, especially if you started with a story, have a clear call to action, and make sure you have that energy. Now, we've talked about those three things already, right? We talked about reframing that limiting belief. We've talked about how to convince your team with your communications. And then we talked about public speaking. These are absolutely communication tips to stand out and for you to think about in the workplace this year in 2023. But like I promised, my favorite and what I truly think is going to be one of the most important tips for this year is this. It's learning how to be an inclusive speaker at work. Perhaps it's something that you may have thought of, thought of before, or it may be something that you're like, you know what, I actually never thought about what does that even mean? Being an inclusive speaker at work is something we can all do. Being an inclusive speaker is also figuring out how can you speak up without also having that friction, right? We've been in meetings where maybe somebody is speaking up and they are cutting people off. That is not being an inclusive speaker. You want to learn how to be an inclusive speaker because it's also how you can create a great team dynamic. What does this mean? How do you do it? I'm going to share with you what we teach at Soulcast Media, which is the 4A framework. And this is how, and this is actually what you need to do and think about to be an inclusive speaker. The 4A, it stands for four things. The first step, essentially, to be an inclusive speaker is this. You got to be an active listener. You have to look around. You have to look at people's nonverbal communications. You have to also listen to people's tone. This is how you can identify when to chime into meetings. Again, what we're trying to do is not be that kind of abrasive speaker. Or we, it, you know, a lot of times when it comes to speaking up in meetings, it's also about timing. And that's why being an active listener is how you can identify when that timing is. The second thing is, okay, now that you've looked around, now that you've kind of maybe identified, okay, maybe this is around the time I need to speak up because now we're talking about compliance. And let's say you sit on the compliance team, or let's say the team is now talking about a specific uh, data, right? And you're like, oh, I know a lot about this data. So this is now when I can start to chime in. Because you've noticed that, because you're listening. The second is, how do you acknowledge? So acknowledging means you are, you're listening to somebody say something, and now you chime in, but you chime in by first saying, Jessica, 
that was a really interesting point. You're acknowledging. When you say those few words, it's kind of your way of almost bridging yourself into the conversation without being very abrasive. The next, after you acknowledge, you do what I call anchoring. So anchoring essentially is repeating what the person said right before you. If my colleague John was talking about finances, right? And in my mind, I'm like, oh, I want to contribute right now because I have something to say. You can say, hey, John, that was a really interesting point that you made about the finances. What I did was anchor. I was essentially repeating just one or two key words that he was saying so that now I can loop in, which goes into my fourth A. Now I can say my answer. This is a flow, a framework, essentially, for you to think about how you can speak up in meetings and do it so that you are being inclusive. You're actively listening, you're acknowledging, you're anchoring, and then you are answering. Your answer, of course, is what it is that you have to say. What is this fantastic point that you're trying to make? What's the answer that you would like everybody to know? If you follow this 4A framework, which I truly believe is going to be one of the most important skills for teams to better also communicate with each other, if you can think about being an inclusive speaker, people will hear your voice, hear your ideas much more in meetings because they won't think like, oh, why is, she, why is he or she just cutting in, right? You're doing it in a way that builds inclusivity. So at this point, We've talked about so much. We've talked about, oh my gosh, we talked about reframing limiting beliefs. We talked about how to speak to convince. We shared tips on how to be a public speaker. And we talked about how you can learn how to be an inclusive speaker. These are four things that I truly think is what is considered being a strategic communicator. And the fact that you are here, I see most of you have stayed on this entire time. My hope is now that you have learned these skills, the question is, how can you apply it? And that is a question that I have for you. As you think about your work, whether it's your morning, your evening, it's tomorrow or later on today, how can you remember to do these things? Well, like I mentioned earlier, in the communications world, Communications is a never-ending process. Learning how to do these things should never stop. Today, we all spent about 45 minutes together, right, where I was teaching you all these tips. But this is just a small fraction of what it means to learn the skills to be a strategic communicator. Like I mentioned, for example, in my public speaking trainings that I do, they're usually hours long. So what I spoke with you all and what I taught you all today, this is just a small sliver. But what it is that you have learned today, I want you to think about it. And most importantly, I want you to figure out how to apply. It. So maybe some of you guys are taking down notes. I highly encourage you to, you know, write it on a sticky note or just somewhere that you can put next to you that's visible. Because the thing is, I don't want you to forget these things. Learning is one thing, right? You learn it. But the question is, can you actually do it? Now, here at Soulcast Media, I want to share with you all. We pride ourselves in our communications training. We, we do so, I mean, it's what we do. I want to actually invite you all to join what we call, it's our Soulcast Media Membership, and it's actually a monthly communications program that we host every single month. In fact, our next one is next week. Every single month, I teach you a new communications topic, kind of similar to what I did here, but in a lot more detail. I'll tell you the coming months, we have all our topics already planned out. But the Soulcast Media Membership is a great way for you to think about leveling up your skills. Because like I said, it never ends. This membership, if it's something that you're interested in, is something that we meet every single month. You also have exclusive videos where I teach you a new topic. Here's our calendar. 
next month, actually, well, no, this month, in next week, I'm going to be teaching you all this topic called confident mindset. February, I'm going to be teaching you all how to disagree with tact. How do you disagree with your team, but do it well? And in March, I'm going to go into a lot more detail of this idea of inclusive speaking. The Soulcast Media Membership, we launched about two and a half years ago. And it's one of the things that I personally am most proud of here at Soulcast Media. The QR code to join um, is here, so you can just scan it. But it's one of the things I'm most proud of because I actually get to meet folks like you all. We meet every month. We learn a new communications topic. And you get access to me where I answer these things these topics for you in these live group coaching calls. But if you can't attend these group coaching calls, you also as a member have access to a portal where all the videos are posted. If you can't scan the QR code here on your screen, um, you can go to my profile on LinkedIn and there's a, there's a bar. I'll show it to you in a little bit. But here's the exciting thing. If you all are interested in joining this month, we're having a little promo here at Soulcast Media. If you join, you will have access to one one-hour one-on-one communications coaching session. If you've never had communications coaching with a communications coach, it's one of the most valuable things that I think anyone can ever experience. It's working with somebody on your own specific communication skill. I know some of our members here are actually joining us in this session today. So I'm so happy that you are here. But I want to let you all know, if you join our membership this month, you will all get access to one one hour session with one of our communications coaches who can work with you on an upcoming presentation or just work with your communications confidence, anything communications related. But it's just our promo for January 2023 because we want you to Think about your communications and start off this year on the right foot. So you can either scan this QR code, which will take you to the website where you can learn more about this membership. If you cannot scan the QR code, because maybe you're watching this on your phone right now, you can just go to my LinkedIn. Hopefully we're already connected, but you can click this link on my profile page, which is the monthly communications workshop at the end of today's workshop. And it'll take you to that membership page and you can learn all about it. So for those who are just, you know, meeting me for the first time, I want to say, you know, thank you. Thank you for spending your morning, your evening, your afternoon with us. I'm here in California. It's it's close to our noon time right now. But I'm so honored that you all have stayed to learn these very important communication tips. I mentioned we started Soulcast Media about four years ago, and I'm so proud to have worked with so many amazing companies. These are just some of the few companies that I've been invited to teach my communications training to at companies like Google, Medtronic, Mattel, S&P Global, and Microsoft to speak to their teams on how they can build that communications confidence. Now, I mentioned some of the ways we can work together. I mentioned that monthly com communications membership. Again, you can go to my profile and check that out to see if that's right for you. But if you if you met me already because you've seen some of my courses, well, you probably know I have a lot of communications courses as well. I have nine here on LinkedIn Learning. I'm so proud to be a LinkedIn Learning instructor. My courses are, thankfully, and I'm so happy to say, consistently ranked popular on the LinkedIn Learning website. I have nine on LinkedIn, so you can check that out. I also have courses on Udemy. I have three courses now on Udemy, so you can also check out my courses there. I believe the easiest way to find these courses is just to type in my name, Jessica Chen, and it'll take you to the communications courses that we have. And then finally, we have our communications training workshops, which is the corporate trainings that we do. And these are just some of the, the companies that we work with. So if you are part of a, a, a team where you're looking for training, let us know here at Soulcast Media. You can find more details about us on soulcastmedia.com. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for spending your time with us. I can't believe so many of you have stayed on the entire time. I want to let you know that we are going to be having more of these communications sessions. I call them Soulcast Media Lives. Just go to our website, soulcastmedia.com slash events. 
and you will be able to register for all our upcoming events just like this. And just so you know, our next one is going to be about DEI and communications. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you all for joining. I'm seeing all the, the thank yous in the comments. I appreciate you all, and I look forward to seeing you at our next event. With that, hopefully everybody take care, and I'll see you all soon. All right? Bye, everybody.